Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Hunters and Gatherers. Uh, my name is Dr. Stephen Bodwick. I'm the Executive Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and Professional Development at the School of Medicine, and I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing our speaker for today. Uh, many of you know Dr. Peskovitz as a member of the faculty, a physician who sees patients, who teaches, who does research. Um, Many of you also know her as the Chief Executive Officer of Riley Hospital for Children, one of the most important hospitals in the state and in the entire Midwest. Uh, in that particular role, she's responsible for providing leadership to a large and complex organization, but the ends of her talents and energies don't stop there. Some of you also know that she's the Executive Associate Dean for Research Affairs for the School of Medicine. What you may not know is that the way medical schools are ranked in this country has to do with their success in research. Uh, that's the yardstick in the index that people use. Therefore, the person who has the most significant impact on how this school of medicine gets ranked is Dr. Peskovic. So um, I wouldn't be surprised to add to those that we would see her assuming yet another large responsibility in the university in the, in the days or weeks to come. Uh, because when I sit and talk to Dr. Peskovitz about what I consider to be a phenomenal degree of talent and energy, she always says the same thing. She says, I don't think I'm any more talented than anyone else. I just set goals and work very hard. I set goals. <laughs> you set goals. Even lofty goals sometimes. But this is in an entirely different league. These are goals that are up there amongst the stars. In fact, what Dr. Orpeskovitz does is not only shoot for the stars, she's able to reach them. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Orpeskovitz. Well, thank you, Steve, for that um, unnecessarily generous um, introduction. Um, I have to tell you, where is Debbie Kelly? Debbie, uh, when you asked me to give this talk, you said, would you mind coming and talking in front of a few of the dean's office staff and telling them some of your ideas about how to reach goals? And I thought, well, sure, no problem. And then all of a sudden, this thing got advertised across our entire campus with all the rest of you showing up here. So let me just say I've decided not to change my original plan, which means that anybody who is here in this room has, by virtue of the fact that you've come here, made a contract with me that you're going to participate. And therefore, I need to know that you have each taken at least three index cards from those that are standing at the front, because this is audience participation that's required to make this program a success. And you need more than the index cards, you need a writing stick of some sort. So I hope you have them. If you don't, please raise your hands and somebody will come around and bring you uh, at least three index cards. Okay, so to get started, we're going to start with your first index card. And I would like you to number the index card one through 10. You can use the front and the back. And I want you to take a moment and think about the 10 most important things that you need to do this week, Monday through Sunday of this week. Top 10. And I'm not going to give you a lot of time, so work and think quickly about this. This should include things that are important to you in your personal life as well as your professional life. Top 10 things that you think you need to accomplish this week. And as you're doing that, I need you to put a grade next to each one of these things. So an A, a B, or a C with A being the most important of these things, B being intermediate, and C being least important. Jan, could you give index cards to people coming in? What we're asking you guys to do, those of you who are just arriving, 
um, Dr. Boyer, is to write down the top 10 things that you have to do this week. And there are plenty of seats up front. And you won't be called on more if you sit up front. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I assume that you've written your top 10 things and that you have given each of those 10 things a grade, A, B, or C. A is very important, B is intermediate importance, and C is least important. Now you need your second index card. And you can title your second index card, My Lions. These things on your second index card are the most important goals that you have in your life. And this should be numbered one through three. Dr. O'Donnell, the first card is to fill out your top ten most important things in your life this week. And your second card is the top three most important goals that you have for yourself through the course of the rest of your life. And as you're doing that, I think I'll share with you examples that I have from my own experience. And I have to say that these goals that you have, that you might call my lions, were goals that could have been there 10 years ago or 20 years ago, or they might have just been goals that you acquired just yesterday. So 30 years ago, my lions were three things. My first goal, I was in medical school, and my first goal at that time was to have six children. That was the single most important thing to me. My second goal was to play the piano semi-professionally. And my third goal was to practice medicine part-time because I knew that having six children and playing the piano semi-professionally probably were incompatible with practicing medicine full-time. Well, here we are 30 years later, and I obviously was completely unsuccessful in achieving those goals. So Steve, thank you for that beautiful introduction, but I failed. And I did not achieve any of those three goals. Mark and I have three children, not six. I don't touch the piano at all. <laughs> Haven't played it for the last 30 years. And um, as Steve said, I don't work part-time. Um, I have uh, at least two full-time jobs. So it's OK for your goals to be different today than they may have been in the past. Those of you that came in after I started, I still want you to do this assignment but it won't have the same impact if you do it in this order. And that is, the first card was to fill out the top 10 things that you have on your to-do list to do this week. And the second card is to fill out the three most important things that you as an individual hope to achieve in your life. And this is what we call the lions. Now, as you look at that list of top 10 things that you're going to accomplish this week, I wonder whether you should ask yourself the following three questions. If I do every one of the things on this list successfully, will that get me closer to a life goal? And then you should ask yourself the second question. If I do this particular thing on this list unsuccessfully, I spend effort on it, and I do it unsuccessfully, will that matter? And then you should ask yourself the third question. What if I just don't do this thing that's on this list? Like, let's say you said you were going to make your bed. What would happen to you in achieving your life goals if you didn't make your bed this week. Would it make a difference? OK, now I said this was all about audience participation. So I have a question for all of you. 
How many of you brushed your teeth today? <laughs> I hope I see every hand here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, keep your hands up. How many of you exercised today? Put them down if you did not. I'll tell you what, if you exercised yesterday, you can put your hand back up. <laughs> Still, you can put them down now. Still less of you exercised yesterday or today than those of you that brushed your teeth. So to me, this is a reflection of a judgment and a prioritization that you have made. And what that says to me is that those of you that brushed your teeth but did not exercise are much more worried about dying of halitosis, which is bad <laughs> breath, for those of you that don't know, than you are of getting diabetes or heart disease, right? Because you've made a choice. You've made a choice to not exercise. Now, if you didn't exercise yesterday or today, but it's on your to-do list, you get half credit okay, for that. But that's an important way for you to ask the question, did I put on my to-do list important things? Have any of you seen the play, the one-man play, uh, The Caveman? Okay, some of you see that? It's a great play. Okay, well this is a wonderful play that talks about our, it's actually called Defending the Caveman. And it talks about our evolutionary instincts. And if you think back to anthropologic times, we all derived from hunters and gatherers. By the way, Dr. Hoyer, this is what hunters and gatherers is about, not about some obscure German text, which is what Dr. Gerard told Dr. Hoyer this talk would be about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But what it says to me, Dr. Gerard, is that you did not see the play Defending the Caveman. <laughs> well, we all derived from hunters and gatherers. Hunters were typically the men in our society. And their job was to wake up in the morning and go out and hunt. They hunted for the meat. They brought home the kill. And then they expected the gatherers, the wives, to prepare the dinner. Women were typically considered the gatherers. And women's job was to gather berries, gather straw, gather the wood so that they could make the fire, so that they could prepare the meat. Well, of course, we're well beyond the days of the caveman. But these evolutionary instincts are still there. So how do they manifest themselves today? Well, let's take shopping, for example. Let's say you're a man and you need a tie. You have hunting instincts. So you go to the store, you make a beeline for the tie rack, and you take the first tie, you grab the very first tie that you see. Never mind that it doesn't match the shirt that you went to get the tie for or the suit that you're wearing. Success. You have killed a lion. You have that tie, and you're out of there. But let's say your genetics is from the gatherers, and let's say you are derived evolutionarily from a gatherer. Your job is to go to the store and pick out a tie for your mate, or for your friend, or for your son, or for your husband. And you have gathering instincts. You know where the tie rack is, but on your way to the ties, you happen upon the purses, or the shoes, or the perfume, or the jewelry, or the dresses. Now you make your way eventually to the tie rack, and when you pick out a tie, you gatherers, you will pick out the perfect tie. It will match perfectly. But think of all these other extraneous things that you picked up along the way. Sure, they might come in useful sometime, 
but when? Were they what you went to do? My premise is that whether you're a man or a woman, when it comes to your life goals, you should be a hunter. But you should hunt for lions. And those lions are the big, hairy, audacious goals that you have on your lion list. Those are the things that need to be there. The rest of you, if you look at your to-do list carefully, have probably killed a bunch of flies, <laughs> but you probably haven't successfully hunted for any lions. Okay, so as you go about hunting for your lions, there are two ways you can do this. You can do this efficiently and you can do this effectively. Now most people, when they talk about the words efficient and effective, they use them interchangeably. They usually use them together, but they don't really think about what we mean by the difference between efficient and effective. So let me tell you what the difference is between efficient and effective. Let's say that someone has given you 100 individual dollar bills. 98 of those bills are single dollar bills, and two of them are $100 bills. You're holding these bills in your hand, and a big wind comes and blows all the bills, scattering them all over the place. The efficient person, he will lean down and immediately begin to pick up as many bills as he can. But the effective person will be a hunter. And the effective person will hunt first for the two $100 bills and then pick up all the rest of the single dollar bills. So when you hunt, it is important to be not only efficient, but more importantly, to be effective. What's that? Bell-shaped curve. Bell curve. Okay. Bell-shaped curve is an important curve that describes a lot of things. We probably all first saw this in school when we got grades that were based on a bell-shaped curve. My three kids who are in college are regularly telling me what their grade is, but they don't just tell me their grade, they tell me what it looks like on the curve. Because a 72 could be an A if it's curved properly. And a bell-shaped curve is important for certain things. I see a lot of cardiologists here today. So it's important for blood pressure, for example, because if you look at the population's blood pressure, there's a normal blood pressure, let's say it's 100 over, 120 over 80, and then there's a normal distribution around that blood pressure for the rest of the population. The same is true for many other things that we think about. I see quite a few endocrinologists here today. When we look at height, for example, in the population, we know that there is a bell-shaped curve around a normal height. A normal adult male height is 5 foot 10, and maybe on this end of the bell-shaped curve we might have uh, 6 foot 3, and on this end we may have 5 foot 5. So that is the way many things are described. But actually, if you think about how you went, want to spend your time, that isn't a very good way to think about it. And in fact, you would be far better off thinking about a curve that looks like this. And this is a curve that was first created by an economist from Italy by the name of Vilfredo Pareto. Some of you have probably heard about Pareto charts. And this economist noted something very interesting in the population in Italy. He noted that 80% of the wealth in Italy was held by approximately 20% of the population. So it was not evenly distributed. There wasn't a mean income, and then everybody fell on two sides of the curve. The majority of the wealth was held by a minority of the people. The same is true in the United States today and true all over the world. 
Well, this then became known as the 80-20 rule. And this rule applies to a lot of important things. Think about it. Most of you probably read the newspaper today. 80% of the news is in 20% of the newspaper. The rest is full of advertising. Those of you who see patients know that 80% of our patient complaints and 80% of our patient problems come from 20% of our patients. As Dean for Research, we have 1,300 faculty. I can tell you that 80% of the problems that I see from faculty come from 20% or less. Uh, that doesn't mean it's a small number of complaints. It just means <laughs> it's a small number of people making a large number of the complaints. So 80-20 is a very important principle. 80% of the airplanes in the United States fly through 20% of the hubs. And I would venture to tell you that 80% of the value of your to-do list is in 20% of the things that you have on the list. It might be in 0% of the things that you have on your list, but I'm hoping that tonight you will go home and look at these two lists side by side and make sure that you have at least 20% of the things on your 10, top 10 list that are very important things that will help get you closer to hunting your lions. Because if there's nothing on that list, and you aren't going to do those things today, but you say, well, maybe I'll do those things, like train for the marathon next week, or maybe start writing my novel next week, or maybe I'll compose my book next week, or maybe I'll start writing my grant next week. Or maybe I really want to work in the third world and I want to go to our program in Eldoret, Kenya, but I really don't see how I can do it now and I'll start thinking about that next week. Chances are you'll never do it. So it needs to be on this week's to-do list if, in fact, you ever hope to get those things done. So when you think about it, you need to make sure that you put those things on this week's to-do list. Okay, now I want to make, um, so let me just say though that in terms of your time, we use this basic principle that is that you want to get the highest return on investment. This is also an economics term. How do you get the biggest bang for the buck? And I would say that what you're really aiming for is how do you get the biggest return on investment of your time? How are you going to spend your time to get the biggest bang for the buck? And that's what you really need to focus your energies around. Okay, now I want you to take a moment and think about some special people that you know that have truly accomplished extraordinary things. People that you think are more accomplished than the ordinary people people who have made a huge difference in the world, have done something truly remarkable. You want to be one of those people. And what Steve said I said is true. Every single person in this room has the potential to do at least one truly extraordinary thing. So you need to think about those people and take a moment and think about what characteristics do those people have in common that maybe distinguishes them from the rest of us? I've given this a little bit of thought, and I've come to the conclusion that there are three characteristics that define these very special people. I call them the three C's. The first C, in my mind, is contribution. The second C is commitment. And the third C is creativity. And when these three Cs, a sense of needing to make a contribution, having an extraordinary sense of commitment, and going about your work with true creativity, all coalesce in a single person, that's, I believe, when you begin to see exceptional and extraordinary things happen. Anne Frank, who lived in the Holocaust time in, uh, under the most dire 
of circumstances, was still able to write. Isn't it marvelous that no one needs to wait even one moment before beginning to make the world a better place? How do you go about your work when you think about your goals, when you think about your lions? I hope that included in those three lions is not only a personal goal, like climbing Mount Everest, but a goal that will make a contribution that will have a huge impact on others. What will you do that will contribute not only to yourself, but to the rest of the society? It could be a small society. It might be your family. But it needs to extend beyond yourself. So think about the contribution that you might make. The second C, commitment. I think of that as pretty much brute force. That is the hard work. That is the time that you put in. Even if you've got great plans to make a contribution, if you don't put in the time, if you're not dedicated and resolute and determined, you aren't very likely to get very much done. I want to take a minute and tell you about somebody who I think of as a role model and a hero. Somebody who exemplifies these first two C's extraordinarily well. Some of you who work here at Riley know her. Her name is Flora. Do any of you know her? Raise your hands if you know her. Some of you know her. And Flora is one of Riley's housekeepers. Flora has been a housekeeper at Riley for the last 30 years. And she is, to me, a role model. Because she exemplifies these first two C's better than almost anybody I know. So last year, Flora was selected by Clarion as the recipient of one of our Exceptional Service Awards. And I asked her, I went to her and I said, Flora, do you know why you got this award? And she said, I have no idea. I said, well, what do you do at work? What do you do when you go to work every day? Because I couldn't understand how we gave an award for superior contribution to a housekeeper. And Flora said, well, I make the children at Riley better. And I thought, well, how do you make the children at Riley better? You're not a doctor. You're not a nurse. You're not a respiratory therapist. You're not a social worker. You're not a secretary, a unit secretary. How do you make the children at Riley better? And she said, I make the children at Riley better because when I come to work every day, I know that my part of ensuring that children will get healthier is making sure that the hospital is clean. And I know that when I do my job well, children will get better. And that is my part. And so I don't go to work to clean the floors at Riley. I go to work to make children better. And when you think about your lives, you may have a small job relative to somebody else. You may have a big job relative to somebody else. But everybody can make that contribution. Let me tell you about Flora's commitment. Flora, as part of this award, received $3,000. Flora has spent the last 30 years on a housekeeper's salary. And she has both children and grandchildren to raise. She took that $3,000 honorarium that she gave, that she received, and she gave $1,500 of that to her church. And the other $1,500 she gave to our dialysis unit, where she had spent most of her time cleaning the floors. That is an example of commitment as well as contribution. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist to make an important impact on people's lives. OK, now you need your third card. And you need to divide both the front and the back of the third card into two. So just put a line down the middle. And on the left side of, um, of the first part, I want you to draw a flower.
Okay, and on the right side of the first card, um, I want you to um, take the number eight and divide it in two. Now I want you to turn your card over, and I hope you've um, put a line down the second half of the card, or the back half too. And without lifting your pen or pencil, I want you to take the number six and turn it into seven with a single stroke. And on the last quarter of the card, I want you to take the number nine, and again, without lifting your pen or pencil, make that the number six. Okay, you all have an extra couple minutes, seconds here, to finish the card. How many of you drew a flower that looks something, something like this? I'm a terrible artist. I bet you all think you got the prize. <laughs> Who drew a different kind of flower? Wow, quite a few of you. That's great. Um, give me a few examples. What did you draw? What kind of flower? I drew a rose. A rose. Anybody else? Just shout it out. A tulip. A tulip. Anybody else? A what? Wow, who did that? <laughs> did you ever come to my talk before? Cool, you got the prize. Okay, the second question. The number eight. How many of you put four? Pretty good. Okay, how many of you put zero? Excellent. How many of you put three? Really? Well, three and a backwards three. <laughs> oh, you have the backwards three, too. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Now we're on, to, we'll see if you, it's not the same people, interestingly. Okay. How many of you know how to turn the number six into seven without lifting your pen? I see one hand here, a few of you. These have to be people that haven't heard me ask you this question before. Okay, could you come up here and do it? Interesting. Very interesting. Any other solutions to this problem? Again, oh, you can't play if you've played before. Anybody else? Yeah. You sure you didn't play this before, Michelle? Okay. I need to get another pen. Oh, well, you are very creative for sure. Um, did anybody do this? Oh, gosh, I have to get another pen. Ah, okay, we have a few. Oh, wow, okay. You're going to turn into a great endocrinologist, Jacob. Okay, and how about those of you, did anybody figure out a solution to six from nine? A lot of people did that, six and nine. How about this? Nine. <laughs> Einstein said that creativity is far more important than intelligence. Because if you really want to make a difference in the way you approach your work, you will look at the world in a way that is different from everybody else. We all see the same things when we look at the world. But some special people are able to see something a little bit different 
than everybody else. And those people apply creativity to their work. None of these three C's, contribution, commitment, or creativity, are things you need to be born with. All three of these things are things that you can acquire if you spend some time doing so. So think for a minute about people who require creativity in their work. You really can't be an artist if you aren't going to be creative. You probably can't be a composer or a writer, otherwise you're plagiarizing what somebody else has done. You have to create something new that didn't previously exist if, in fact, you're going to be in one of those professions. But what about the rest of us? What if you are an administrator? I see a few co-administrators up here. We have the world's most boring jobs. And most of us would not think that creativity is important in being an administrator. What about being a secretary, or being Flora, or being a doctor, or a lawyer, or a judge, or a business person? Well, I would say that if you really want to do something special in any of those areas, you will recognize that creativity is at least as important as contribution and commitment to doing your job well. So when you stop and think about what those very special people do, you will recognize the importance of all three of these things in their lives. Okay, now let's take a minute and think a bit more about creativity. Because breakthrough creative thinking is the hardest thing we have to do if we're going to accomplish the things on our life goals. And so when you go home tonight and redo your to-do list and make sure that you have A activities on that list that are going to get you closer to hunting for your lions, you have to make sure that you leave A time for those A activities. So you have to think for a moment about yourself, and everybody is different. Most of us endocrinologists believe that because of the circadian rhythms, we think that most people are at their most energetic in the morning. And I can say that for me, that's true. That may be why I'm not doing such a great job here, middle of the afternoon. Um, but other people have their most creative moments in the afternoon, or in the evening, or the middle of the night. Regardless, you need to think about yourself and take a moment and seriously contemplate when are you going to do your hardest work. Because that 20% of your to-do list that has the 80% of the value is the hardest to do. And so you need to carve out for yourself A time if you're going to do A activities. John and Steve are sitting up here, and I gave them a very difficult project. They better use A time to work on that project, because that project, which is a boring administrative project to the rest of you, requires creativity. And so you need to make sure that you find that A time. Now, what's the problem for most of us? The problem for most of us is that we typically squander that A time because the work that we have to do is so hard. So what you need to do is to protect yourself. And there are two types of protection that you need. You need to get a coat of armor. And this coat of armor is to protect you first from everybody else, and second, from yourself. And I will say that I find it much easier to protect myself from you than I do from myself. Now, what are you going to do to protect yourself from others? Well, if you have secured A time for an A activity, you better not let anybody interrupt your A time. Because if you let somebody else interrupt your A time, you will not accomplish what you needed to accomplish during that time that you have secured for yourself. So you need to think about what kinds of things are likely to interrupt you, and you need to prevent them. How many of you answer a phone as part of your job? If it's your job to answer the phone, raise your hand. OK. You guys need to answer the phone. Okay. The rest of us don't need to answer the phone. And we certainly don't need to answer the phone in our A time. 
okay? Because if you use your A time to answer the phone, somebody might be very grateful. Dr. O'Donnell, you are the most wonderful cardiologist, and my parents can call you any time of the day or night. But chances are you have squandered your A time talking to my dad. <laughs> and so you need to think about whether or not your A time is that valuable to you. You can still talk to my dad, but you should talk to him during your B time or your C time, and not during the time that you're going to be the most creative. Because once you have squandered your A time, it's gone. And so you really need to protect yourself. How many of you have ever had somebody come to you and say, you got a minute? <laughs> most of you in this room have come to me and asked me, do you have a minute? Beware of got a minute. <coughs> I have never, ever, I'm 50 and a half, I have never had anybody ask me if I have a minute, use a minute of my time. Okay. I love talking to people and I love hearing what it is that you have to say. But when you ask me if I have a minute, you're probably asking for more than a minute. And if I have scheduled an hour of A time, and you've used one minute of that, chances are I've lost that whole hour. So it's not that you shouldn't give people time, but it means that you need to schedule that time that you're giving them. And it shouldn't be in your very special time. So if you're working on that project for me, <laughs> and it's very important, it requires A thinking, don't let any of these other people interrupt you because we're going to care at the end that we've got the best possible project at the end of the day. And so don't squander it. Now what about protecting yourself from yourself? I'm really terrible at this because, for example, I get about 300 messages, email messages a day. You will all be, Charlene, you will be pleased to know that I left my Blackberry in my office because they stuck me with all these things here. I've got, I'm tied up with all these um, wires. But I get about 300 messages a day. My A time is the morning. When I wake up in the morning, I usually have, on average, 30 messages waiting for me. My inclination is to go and read and respond to those messages for two reasons. One, because I'll actually feel like I'm getting something done. They do have to get done. And I'll feel like I'm checking things off my to-do list. But I will have killed a lot of flies if I used my lion hunting time to read those emails. And I probably wouldn't have started down the path of hunting those lions. And I could have waited for later in the day. The other reason, of course, that I answer the emails right away, well, I guess there are three reasons. One, I'm very compulsive. But the other reason is because you guys have grown to expect that we're going to respond right away. So we may need to have a bit of change in our expectations of one another if, in fact, we hope to do a good job of using our A time and squeezing out the most productivity that we can out of various people. Now, I've talked for a bit about what I consider the three most important characteristics of successful people. There is one other characteristic that I think typifies many, if not most, and nearly all successful people. And that is, if you think about them, most successful people are happy people. I don't know if they're successful because they're happy, or if they're happy because they're successful. But one way or another, if you think about it, miserable people usually aren't successful. There are some exceptions to that. I know a few exceptions to that. But for the most part, successful people are happy. And most of those successful people feel like they are the luckiest people in the world. They feel like they, the world just was opened up for them. They can't believe how lucky they are. My father is somebody like this. And my father always says that his vocation is his avocation, that his work 
is his pleasure, and that he works in a way on things that he gets pleasure from. So I asked Flora what she thought about her work, because I couldn't think that it was fun or lucky to get to clean the floors at Riley Hospital every day. And Flora said, I am the luckiest person in the world to have this job. And so, you see, it doesn't really matter if you have a job as the CEO of the hospital or as the housekeeper at the hospital. You can find success and happiness at every level. Now, I have to admit that there are times that even successful people are unhappy. And so what do you do when you're unhappy? Well, let me just say that you cannot stay unhappy for very long because you will not be successful. So you have to do something about it to change that unhappy state. So there are four things that you can do, and I call these the four L's. If you are unhappy, the first thing you have to do is to try to change the circumstance that makes you unhappy. So you have to lobby for change. So let's say you love your job, but you're not paid enough. You have to ask for it. Let's say you love your job, but you need to have a window in order to be more creative. You have to ask for it. Not saying you're going to get it, by the way, those of you that asked, that, that smiled at that one. Let's say you just need more flexible hours because you have children at home and you really want to do your work. And you're likely to be the most productive person around to do that particular job, but you can't work eight to five. You lobby for a change. When I came here 19 years ago, when we first started to look at a position here 20 years ago, Mark, my husband, was being recruited by the Department of Surgery. And we had three little children, ages less than one, less than two, and less than three at the time. And I wasn't originally offered a position. And so, at the time that my husband was being an offered, offered a position here, I was offered what appeared to me at the time to be terrific jobs in Los Angeles, in Chicago, and in Boston. And they were, on paper, far better jobs than the non-job that I eventually took <laughs> here. So you can be sure, those of you that know me, that I lobbied awfully hard to try to change that outcome and to try to ensure that I would go any place but India no place. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was unsuccessful in my lobbying efforts. And so, before long, it became clear that we were coming here no matter what. And it did turn out to be, at the time, uh, the right decision for our young family. So I came here, and that left me with the second L. Let's say you lobbied for a change, and you didn't get it. What's your second option if you're unhappy? The second option. is live with it. And in fact, I have to say that I didn't need the last two L's, or at least the third L, because when I came here and I saw the opportunities that really were here to grow both personally and professionally, when I learned how wonderful a place it was to raise a family, and when I could identify career opportunities for myself, I didn't just live with it. I went after those opportunities with zeal because I realized that even as I think back on it today, there's no way that had I taken any of those three other jobs, things would have turned out as well for me as they did because I came here. So I was really able to not only live with it, but turn it into something that I believe has really been wonderful for me and hopefully for others. 
But sometimes, after you try very hard to lobby for change, you try to live with it, you still can't. And that does happen. And unfortunately, that can happen in marriages. And it can happen in jobs. And it can happen in many other things that we try to do. The bottom line is you cannot permit yourself to be miserable. And so if you've tried very hard to lobby for a change, you've tried very hard to live with it, maybe after you've impacted some of those changes, and you still cannot be happy, then it is time to leave. Because it is better in the long run to be happy in another circumstance and successful. You will not be maximally successful if you are unhappy. And then the last L should be applicable to all of you in whatever you do, and that is that you should make the effort to laugh. Now, I said that there were three characteristics of successful people. They are committed to creatively make a contribution, and they're happy. There's a fourth characteristic. They're happy, but they're never content. Happy and content are not the same thing. It's possible to be happy and not be content. I'll tell you what's wrong with being content. Contentedness leads to complacency and to mediocrity. People who are maximally successful believe in Robert Browning's principle that a man's reach should always exceed his grasp for what is heaven for. In other words, very successful people are never content with what they've accomplished. They are always pushing the bar. They are always trying to reach higher to reach for the stars, to try to do it more successfully, discover more as a researcher, do it better, do it more creatively, do more of these things that we try to do. And that reaching for the stars is what keeps people and institutions constantly getting better and better. I told you early on what my three goals were when I started medical school. I didn't tell you what they are today. Today, my three goals are that my three and not six children will be maximally successful as adults, that they will be independent and productive and make critical contributions in their own right. My second goal is, as Steve alluded to, that our School of Medicine, which currently is ranked in the 40s out of 125 schools of medicine, will be ranked in the top 20 schools of medicine in the country. And that Riley Hospital, which is currently ranked 11th out of the 250 children's hospitals in the United States, will be ranked fifth out of all those children's hospitals. I call this reaching for the stars. Now, what happens when you reach for the stars and you miss? Sometimes you land on the moon. And that's probably OK as long as you didn't tell everybody that you were reaching higher. It's fine to tell them you were just aiming for the moon. Because think about how many people reached the moon. Most of them never got there in the first place. OK, let me ask you all another question. We've been talking about satisfaction. Please raise your hands if you feel you have a perfect life. <laughs> well, OK, how about this? Raise your hands if you think you have a perfect job. OK, keep your hands up. If you have a perfect job and a perfect salary. Ooh. <laughs> OK, does anybody have a, a perfect boss? <laughs> Some of you. I, I think there are a few of you in here that better raise your hands. <laughs> OK. What about perfect children? How about perfect parents? I have to raise my hand because my parents are here. OK. 
Well, here's the hard one. How about a perfect mate? Okay. Well, for those of you that don't have a perfect mate, let me give you five tips on how to find the perfect mate. Okay? <laughs> Tip number one, find a mate who will help you around the house, who will do so willingly, and who uh, never turns you down. And he also brings in, he or she, brings in a good income. <laughs> That's tip number one. <laughs> tip, <laughs> tip number two, find a mate who makes you laugh. There you go. <laughs> tip number three, find a mate who never lies to you and never cheats on you. Tip number four, find a mate who loves you dearly and spoils you rotten. <laughs> and tip number five, make sure that none of these other four mates knows one another. <laughs> Perfection is the enemy of good. There is no such thing as a perfect life, a perfect job, perfect children, perfect spouse, perfect parents. God knows there's just no such thing. Perfection is the enemy of good. So, should you still shoot for the stars? Sure you should, because again, you might land on the moon. Now, I said you don't need to make it public if you miss. Well, some of you are aware that my recent miss was quite public. <laughs> and I was not selected to lead Indiana University as its next president when a uh, selection was made by the Indiana University Board of Trustees last March. I believe that President Michael McRobbie will do a phenomenal job in leading Indiana University to its rightful place as one of the nation's premier research institutions. But I have to admit that I was pretty disappointed personally when I missed until I got this letter. Dear Mom, <laughs> I won't be graduating from college this spring as scheduled. Instead, I am leaving the university and I'm moving to Flagstaff, Arizona. Since I'm pregnant, I've decided to join my boyfriend, who is a tattoo artist. <laughs> We've decided to join the Life's Not Fair cult. And we will be living in their commune where they make hemp clothing from the leftover marijuana that we smoke. <laughs> I've just been diagnosed with gonorrhea, Mom. But don't worry, I'm under treatment. Love, your daughter. P.S. Mom, I'm not actually moving to Flagstaff. I'm not really pregnant. And my boyfriend isn't a tattoo artist. In fact, I don't even have a boyfriend. So though I wish I had been sexually active, <laughs> clearly I can't have gonorrhea. <laughs> but mom, I did decide that I'm not going to go to medical school. And instead, I'm planning to become a lawyer that prosecutes doctors. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're very disappointed, mom. But I do hope that my letter gives you a life perspective at this important time in your life. Life is about dreams. It's about those big, hairy, audacious goals. It's about hunting for those lions. But it's also about perspective and balance and flexibility. It's about accepting a moon landing when you were shooting for the stars. Tomorrow will bring each one of you closer to a personal dream that you have. 
And at first, when you pursue that dream, you will think that it is impossible. Dreams always seem implausible and impossible at the beginning. That's why we call them dreams. But as soon as you start to pursue them with a sense of contribution, commitment, and creativity, suddenly they go from being completely impossible and implausible to maybe being improbable to one day being just a bit possible. And before you know it, the momentum is inevitable and these dreams will come true. So I encourage each of you to think about your own individual life goals and start dreaming. Franklin Roosevelt died in Warm Springs, Colorado on April 12th of 1945. And when he died, he was sitting at his desk writing a speech. All of a sudden, he slumped over. And it turns out that the very last words that he wrote were as follows. The only limitation to our realization of tomorrow is our doubts of today. I'm here to tell you that there are no limitations to the realization of your dreams for tomorrow. As the futurist Leonard Sweet said, your future is not something you just enter. Your future is something that you create. Thank you.